The title of my sermon today is Loving My Everyday Enemies. Loving My Everyday Enemies. Now, that's what's on the marquee outside of the church building. If you drove by, you saw the PM sermon, Loving My Everyday Enemies. There's also a subtitle to this lesson, and the subtitle to this lesson is What I Like About Muslims. Now, I didn't put that up on the marquee sign because I was afraid it might get shot up. A Couple of bullet holes in it before the week was out. Now, Loving My Everyday Enemies is a good title because each of us have people in our lives that cause us grief. Could be a cranky spouse, could be an unfair boss, could be a friend that has betrayed our trust, even the server at Chili's who is rude. These people become for a brief moment an enemy. And a lesson about patience and kindness and forgiveness would be helpful to you know, smooth out the rough spots caused by these kinds of people. But Muslims seem to be a common denominator type of foe. Because it doesn't matter if you're single or married or Republican or Democrat or young or black or old or white, they are our common enemy these days. As Americans, we seemed divided politically and socially, but when it comes to Muslims, there's agreement about how we feel about them. Feelings that range from fear to hatred to a desire to eliminate them and their religion in this country and dominate them militarily in their country. So you can see that preaching a sermon about what I like concerning Muslims can be quite a challenge, especially when you consider 9-11, and the thousands of American men and women who have died or have been wounded at their hands. If it will help, please remember that this is not a political speech that I'm making, this is a sermon. A sermon meant to help us as Christians deal in a Christian way with a very real and powerful enemy. Perhaps we'll discover once again that God's ways are not man's ways, especially when it comes to dealing with enemies. So loving your enemies. You know, Christians love to cite Jesus' command to love one's enemies as a way of staking out the uh, moral high ground. We like to say, you know, our, our Lord, our Savior said we ought to love our enemies. Boy, when we say that, we're, we're staking out the moral high ground in any argument. And there are two passages with this teaching, one in Matthew chapter five, Verse 43, I'll read that for you. It says, you have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you in order that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For He causes His Son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what reward have you? Do not even the tax gatherers do the same? And if you greet your brothers only, what do you do more than others? Do not even Gentiles do the same? Therefore you are to be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. And if you have your Bibles, keep going. Flip over to Luke chapter 6, verse 35. Another version of this, 35, 36. Jesus says, but love your enemies and do good and lend, expecting nothing in return and your reward will be great and you will be sons of the Most High for He Himself is kind to the ungrateful and evil men. Be merciful just as your Father is merciful. And so we, we believe that loving one's enemies is the crowning virtue that denotes unmistakable spiritual maturity and it's the acid test for Christ-likeness. I mean, after all, Jesus forgave the people who were in the act of unjustly and cruelly executing Him. 
Unfortunately, not all enemies are equal when it comes to the application of this teaching, especially when it comes to those who follow Islam. Of course, those who espouse violence and hatred in the pursuit of this religion have created social upheaval and suspicion in many countries, including our own. That thousands of American lives have been lost because of these fanatics has created a natural rejection of all Muslims and an easy excuse for hating their religion and hating their culture as well. Much like the internment of innocent and loyal Japanese Americans in World War II, the rhetoric of war stirs up mass hatred that often blinds us to what is true and what is just. We become twice victimized, once by the attack of our enemies, and then a second time by the unrestrained hatred it creates in us. Like illicit drugs or alcohol, hatred causes us to do things which in our right minds we would never think of doing. We would never think of thinking. You see, Satan's strategy is not in provoking us to war. It's in seducing us to hate. You see, Wars eventually end, but hatred continues from generation to generation. We may win the military battle, but Satan achieves his end game by infecting us as a nation, by infecting us with hatred. And so in order to find some, some sort of balance here in our approach to actually obeying Jesus' instructions to love one's enemies and avoid the slippery slope into the destructive cycle of hatred, I'd like to share some qualities that I like, that I admire about Muslim men and women. After all, in order to love, you have to begin somewhere and maybe like or admire might be a good starting point. So what I like about Muslims, first of all, I like their zeal for their religion. I like that about them. They, in general, have a true enthusiasm for what they believe. I'm not talking about the zealots and the extremists who manipulate and coerce in order to empower themselves using any means to win. I mean, you can use the Koran to justify plain murder and often and other forms of lawlessness, but evil men hiding behind religion, this is not restricted to Islam. I mean, some have used the Bible to justify murdering abortion doctors or harassing mourners at military funerals. And Britain used scripture to defend slavery, as did the South. And Catholic priests used their position to lure young boys into sexual activity. Does this mean that all Bible believers are ready to murder abortionists? Does it mean that all Southerners are racists? Does it mean that all Catholics are pedophiles? You see, what I admire is the zeal of the ordinary Muslim to practice and share his religion. I mean, they kneel and they pray in public. This is in non-Muslim countries. They kneel and they pray in public five times a day because they have zeal for their religion. The women wear a headscarf, which is contrary to modern fashion. You know, I had a friend who was a member of the church who had a contract to go work in Saudi Arabia and he would tell me about his life there and he said that anyone, whether it was his barber or the mechanic that was fixing his car or a neighbor, anyone over there that knew that he was a Christian immediately wanted to share their faith with him. I like this kind of enthusiasm. Now I need to make a disclaimer here because it's so easy to misrepresent what I'm trying to say tonight. That's why I'm filming it. You can go back and check the tape. So I make disclaimer number one. I do not like or admire their religion. Don't get me wrong. I can show where their religion is lacking theologically, historically, socially. 
What I admire is their enthusiasm for their religion. It's important to them and it's central to their lives and it shows. Another point I like about Muslims, their sense of modesty. Again, the extremists, like the Taliban, for example, they're the ones that get the publicity. For example, you know, women are punished when they're raped and men are left to go free. And uh, the wearing of full body covering like a burqa is legally enforced in some countries. And honor killings by families of women guilty of nothing more than dating non-Muslim men are performed. Those are the extremists, those are the ones that get the headlines. But if you look at the majority of Muslim women in regular families, the goal is simple modesty based on the principle that they do not want to provoke lust from men in the way that they dress and the way that they carry themselves. For example, Muslim women uh, uh, won the right to compete in the Olympic Games in London in the volleyball competition, they petitioned the Olympic Committee and they won the right to wear more modest shorts and more modest t-shirts with sleeves in their competition because they refused to wear the bikinis, the, the, the nearly nothing bikinis that the other athletes from other countries wore because they felt they were immodest. You see, Muslim women recognize the power of sexual attraction and they try to minimize lust in men by underexposing themselves rather than overexposing themselves. Jesus said, everyone who looks on a woman to lust after her has committed adultery with her already in his heart. Matthew 5 verse 28. We shouldn't ridicule or hate a group because they understand this idea and they try to do something about it. We may think that their approach, you know, veils and strict rules about dating you know, with only chaperones, we may think this is strange, but what they're trying to achieve is right and it's beneficial to society. Let me ask you a question. Do we really need more public nudity? I mean, do, really, do we really need that? More public nudity? Do we really need more 13-year-old girls dressed like Madonna? Do we need more sexually transmitted diseases? Do we need more single teen moms? I mean, is that what we really need in our society? Okay, disclaimer number two. I'm not saying that we should dictate by force how women should dress, or impose any laws on how or who people should associate with. What I'm saying is that they take the virtue and the practice of modesty, they take it seriously. Women in Muslim countries who strive to be modest are not considered weird. In other words, I like the goal that they are striving for, not necessarily their tactics in achieving it. A third thing I like about Muslims, they, excuse me, the respect that they have for their holy book. They believe that the Koran was not only inspired by God, but also written in a special language by Him. This is why not only the contents are considered sacred, but the physical book also is highly regarded. Of course, we've seen that this high regard has been manipulated to induce violence, but the fact remains that whether or not there's a riot or simply a strong objection when the Koran is attacked or mishandled, the world is well aware of their attitude toward their holy writings. I like the idea that a person respects what is sacred about their religion and willing to defend it. Unfortunately, we live in a society that rewards disrespect, that heaps praise upon those who commit public sacrilege. You know, in our country, a person places a crucifix 
upside down in a jar of urine, and this is considered great art. And the person or the quote artist who did this, this person has his picture in the paper, this work of art is featured prominently in museums. We live in a place where writers and comedians can disrespect our president no matter who he is and get paid millions of dollars to do it. You know, we can disagree and we can fight against any president's policies or ideas, but personally dishonoring our leader, our leaders rather, lowers our value as a nation and it weakens us before our enemies. You know, many people applaud those who find ways to lower the honor of sacred institutions like marriage or the church, thinking that nothing or no one has a right to be valued more highly than the individual. And we're fast becoming a nation of common denominators where nothing is really sacred except, excuse me, our sports heroes. Oh yeah, they're sacred. Their pictures are always on the front page. I like the sense of respect that all Muslims, from the greatest to the least of all, have for their holy book. A respect shown by how it is handled physically to the central place it takes in each Muslim's life. Disclaimer number three coming. I would not trade the Koran for the Bible. If you compare these two side by side objectively, you readily see the Bible's historical accuracy, its theological depth, the literary beauty and the miraculous elements such as fulfilled prophecy far surpass the contents of the Koran. And yet those who follow the Koran go to great lengths to protect the dignity and use of their sacred text. I'm saying that as a religious person myself who has a high regard for the Bible, I admire their respectful attitude. So let's go back to Jesus' command, shall we, to love our enemies? For the Jews of the first century, the biggest enemy was the Roman Empire. They were pagans, they were ruthless, they were cruel, they were guided only by lust for power and wealth and pleasure. When Jesus was crucified, the Jews conspired to frame Him, but it was the Romans who tortured Him. It was the Romans who humiliated and executed Him in the most painful way they knew how. So bad was crucifixion as a mode of execution that it was not permitted for Roman citizens. By comparison, a roadside bomb is a quick death. Crucifixion was slow and it was painful on purpose. They wanted maximum suffering before you died. Now when Jesus said, Father forgive them for they do not know what they are doing in Luke 23, 34, He was talking about the Romans as well as the Jews. If He was physically among us today, and he was taken prisoner by Islamic extremists and tortured and beheaded as many have been, I believe he would say exactly the same words today. So we may hate Muslims for 9-11 and the wars that we fight in and their efforts to spread their religion, but we don't hate them because Jesus is commanding or encouraging us to do so. We're doing that all on our own. His admonition is to love our enemies. However, his voice is being drowned out by the drumbeat of war, being drowned out by the grief we have over our dead soldiers, and the manipulation of worldly leaders who profit when men hate each other. Loving your enemy is hard, and loving this enemy seems impossible considering our present circumstances. But I ask you, what is the alternative? More war? More hatred? More death? 
I know that Jesus' command is not politically popular or correct. Hey, we're in Oklahoma, we're not in California here, folks. It's not even practical or safe. I mean, it's tough to love someone who hates you, who wants to do you harm, who wants to conquer you. If I said to some Muslim extremist, Jesus told me to love you, he'd say, yeah, very nice, have a nice day, bang, you're dead, Mazalongo. But we belong to the kingdom of light, not the kingdom of darkness, and loving our enemies is our basic standard of conduct. Whether it's your enemy at the office who acts like a self-centered incompetent, or the enemy in your family like a relative who does nothing but judge and criticize you, or the enemy at church who has betrayed your trust and treated you unfairly, or even the enemy halfway across the world who prays to Allah five times a day. The same passage applies to all of these. The approach may be different, but the goal is the same, that in the end we are at peace with all men and owe nothing to anyone except to love them. Romans chapter 12, verse 18. Now the president and his military, they have a different responsibility and approach, and they have this different responsibility and approach with the authority to defend our country given to them by none less than God Himself. That's His responsibility. But my responsibility is clear. I am to love my enemy, whoever that may be. However, I have found that a practical way to do this is to take baby steps at first, not only with Muslims, but just with the enemy who sits in the pew behind me. Baby steps. I begin with trying to like something about them that is true, that is worthy of praise, and so on and so forth, what Paul talks about in Philippians chapter four. For Muslims, it's a true and admirable fact that in general, they have a sincere zeal for their religion and it is noticeable in their practice of it. It is true that Muslim women practice modesty and this virtue is highly prized and sought after among them. And it is true that Muslim people demonstrate a high regard for their holy book that forces other people to respect it even if they don't believe it. Disclaimer number four. These traits that I've just mentioned are generally seen in Muslims, but they are not unique to Muslims. Other religions, including Christianity, have similar, uh, similar features worthy of praise. But I've noticed that Muslims practice these at a much higher level, and this accounts for much of their success in getting converts. People are naturally drawn to a religion whose adherents are enthusiastic, have high moral standards, and are serious students of their own writings. This may be one of the reasons why Christianity is losing ground in countries where both religions are vying for majority status. Countries like Africa, for example. Not that our religion is inferior. I mean, it's the Christian faith that has the inspired writings confirmed by fulfilled prophecy. It's the Christian faith that has the risen Savior witnessed by hundreds. It's the Christian faith that has a church 2,000 years and counting. It's the Christian faith that has the promise of eternal life based on a system of faith, not a system of works, which by the way, Islam is based on. It is a system of salvation by works. No, it's not our religion or our savior that's the problem. It's the poor practice of our faith compared to their practice of their faith that waters down our effective witness for Christ. Some people believe things as true based on how zealous you believe that it's true. Muslims' main arguments against us, you know what they are? 
You know what they say about us? They say we are lukewarm about our faith. They say if we had to suffer for our faith like they suffer for theirs, we wouldn't last very long. They say we are immodest in our attitude and dress. That's one complaint they have about us. And you know what, I have to agree, because sometimes I see people coming to church to worship God dressed in ways that are clearly immodest. And they charge that we lack respect for our own scriptures. I mean, they riot in the street if someone throws away an old Koran. But we remain silent while public figures and entertainers blaspheme the name of the Lord and make fun of the Bible and the people who believe in it in front, in front of millions of people day after day after day after day. You see, it's not that Muslims hate us, they just don't respect us. In finishing, let me say that I know that here in Oklahoma, we're not going to be overrun with Muslim extremists anytime soon. They may be our enemy, but they're pretty far away enemy. However, each of us does have some everyday enemies that are closer to home, in our families, at work, at school, in our neighborhoods, even here in church. And these are very real enemies. They're close by and we have to deal with them. The question is, what will be the first step that you will take to love your everyday enemy? Will you pray for them? Will you begin looking for the good? Will you try to forgive them? Will you speak only when you can speak well of them? To be Christ-like means we have to be moving in the direction of loving our enemies and not finding reasons to hate them. More hatred is Satan's strategy and it only leads to destruction of the soul and eventually destruction of the body. As I close, I invite you to seek the prayers of God or to seek prayer before God in order to make out of you a Christian devoted to loving all of your enemies, those who are far away and those who are close at hand. If you need help with that spiritual journey, we encourage you to come forward and seek the prayers of the elders as we stand and as we sing the song that has been selected for invitation. <laughs>